So if you come with me here. My name is David Malone. I am a science documentary filmmaker, and I've come to Papworth Hospital in Cambridgeshire. So this is the first time you've been in theatre? Yes, indeed, yes. So well, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm very good at following orders. <laughs> I'm here at the invitation of consultant surgeon Mr Francis Wells, who is going to allow me to watch him perform open-heart surgery. He's got a leaky aorta valve. I've always wanted to see the beating human heart, that thing within us that keeps us alive. You'll see when you get in here just how colourful the human body is. It's amazing. You, you, you sound like it's, um, it's, it's never lost its thrill for you. No, not at all. The heart is unlike any other organ in the human body. It has its own rich language and poetry. Throughout history, it has been a potent symbol in our religion, literature, and philosophy. It has been seen as the site of our emotions, the very center of our being. But modern medicine has come to see the heart as just a pump, a brilliant pump, but nothing more. And we view ourselves as ruled by our heads and not our hearts. So that's, that's the valve actually going into place? Going into the root, yeah. And yet there's something about the heart that makes me wonder whether there is more to it than this. You, you open up this body that's lying still and inside there's this other creature <laughs> struggling away. So I want to explore the story of the heart, how it came to lose out in the age-old battle of hearts and minds and ask whether, with the help of modern science, the heart may reclaim its traditional place at the centre of our lives. There's the heart working, fall back in one piece. Open heart surgery is one of the great triumphs of modern medicine. I, it's, I have to tell you, it's the movement which yep. I find extraordinary. The liver just sits there looking ugly, the spleen <laughs> sits there looking ugly, the bowel sits there smelling awfully, the brain sits there doing absolutely nothing. Doing nothing, nothing at all. To perform operations like this, surgeons can't help but view the heart as a machine, something that can be fixed when it goes wrong. But for Mr Francis Wells, one of Britain's leading heart specialists, this is a machine that can still inspire wonder. What we see is, is a bit of muscle contracting here. Yes. But what's going on inside the cells at a metabolic level yes. is immensely complicated. You work with these hearts in every day. You see yes. them, the, yeah. the mechanical side of human nature. Yeah. There is a mechanistic side to it, which yes. is easily appreciable and, yes. and learnable and correctable. But um, you rapidly appreciate that it isn't just mechanical either. Bi biological structures and tissues are beyond mechanical. I mean, yeah, it has a life, it has a momentum. For Mr. Wells, the heart's extraordinary biology gives it a beauty all of its own. He sees no need to romanticize the role of the heart beyond its vital function as a pump. Thank you. Oh, it was, really, it was a privilege. No, not at all. I suppose what I'm looking at is how much of that wonderful poetry, the romantic poetry of the heart is just poetry All and it. how much of it is is a, a poetic report about something that but you see, you've answered the question yourself mm. because you made the point at the beginning that you'd never seen the human heart before no, no, no. and i would bet you that 99.99 percent of the poets in the past have never seen the human heart before we all like this emotional interplay mm. but the the heart is a bunch of muscles mm. with some nerves that stimulate it. And it has some chemical receptors which allow it to respond mm. to chemical and neurological stimuli. Whilst we all want to think of it as being this incredibly fanciful structure, mm. and we all do, mm. in reality, it's a pump. 
That's what it does. Mm. But I know I can take the heart out and you can still fall in love. I know oh. I can take the heart and the liver out and you'll still fall in love. Yeah. I can take the heart, liver and lungs and bowel out and you'll still fall in love. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's useful to know in an emergency, I suppose. Well, it's true, we've done it. But if I ask myself, what part of me feels love for my family? I would say I feel it in my heart. I love my three sons with all my heart. And when I first met my wife, Sarah, my heart skipped a beat. This is the familiar language of the heart, one that talks about being broken hearted or your heart swelling with joy. The whole reason we're making the film is to explore that, that poetic language of the heart, you know, his heart swelled, his heart jumped, his heart burst, his heart broke. Um, I suppose what we're asking is, how much is that language just poetry? And how much of that poetic language is an accurate description of something which is true, just said poetically? And I, and I, I don't know yet. Why this matters is because I believe our view of the heart, in some fundamental sense, is a reflection of how we see ourselves. You see, the problem I have with the modern view we have of ourselves and our world is not so much that it's soulless as, as heartless. We're encouraged to view ourselves as if we live just in our heads, as if our brains rode around in our bodies the way that we drive our cars. And for me, that means we, we relegate everything that we feel, as if somehow our emotions were, were less important than our thoughts. Yet for much of human history, we saw that what made us wonderful creatures was not our brain, but our heart. But was this very different way in which we used to see ourselves so misguided? Richard Parkinson is a curator at the British Museum and is showing me a papyrus over 4,000 years old from ancient Egypt. This is the famous papyrus of Arni, which is part of one of the funeral papyri. For the ancient Egyptians, the heart was the most important organ in the human body. It's very much the symbol of the mind, the emotions, the character. Everything is represented by that particular organ. And did the ancient Egyptians believe that that was the centre of their being? It seems to be that way. The, all the language refers to the heart in descriptions of character. If you're greedy, you are grasping of heart. If you're patient, you're enduring of heart. Oh. The heart is the one thing that really anchors all ideas of personality. The papyrus depicts a scene called the weighing of the heart. The ancient Egyptians believed that a person would only pass into the afterlife if their heart balanced against the feather of truth. If not, the heart would be eaten by the devourer and they would become nothing. Why balanced against truth? It's lovely. I mean, it's lovely. It's truth is the, is the Egyptian way of life. It's something like justice, truth, order in society, in the personal life, in the cosmic life mm. as well. And your heart has to be exactly in a tune with, with ma'at, that, with truth. With that truth. And so ab above the heart in the, in the papyrus, there's the famous heart spell, Where's which that? it just begins here. You can see the sign of the heart there, my heart. Can you read that? It's standard Middle Egyptian. He addresses his heart, um, my heart of my mother. Do not stand up against me as a witness. Um, and oppose me in front of the company of gods. He's There's talking a, to his heart. He's talking to his heart. Just keep the heart quiet. Don't let it give the game away. Because the heart tells the truth. The heart might Which, tell the truth if he's um, encouraged too much by the judges. The heart, physiologically, it does tell the truth, in the sense that I, yes. when you try to lie, your brain says, let's keep calm, let's not give anything That's, away. That, your heart starts yes. thumping and you start yes. sweating. and you're, So the heart, it, it really is. 
the organ which can't help but give you away if you're not careful, which makes that practical admonition so lovely. Absolutely. They must have been a very well-fed monster. Some of them look quite eager. <laughs> <laughs> The ancient Egyptians did not understand that the heart pumps blood around the body, but they did recognize a quality about the heart just as profound. That when we tell lies, it is the beating of our hearts that can betray us. I have to say I like the ancient Egyptians. I like the fact that they see the heart as being connected with truth. Not something airy-fairy like love, but truth, that it simply tells you the truth about how you are, what you are feeling, what you think. And they were right. As the earliest scientists began to explore the heart, what was seen seemed to reinforce the notion that this organ of truth and emotion was also at the center and beginning of life. It was the Greek philosopher Aristotle who first glimpsed this remarkable sight of the embryonic beating heart. For Professor Thomas Brand, developmental biologist at Imperial College London, what amazed Aristotle has lost none of its magic. How old is this one? Three days. Three days. And you can see it fills up yeah. and empties, so you Correct. can actually see the whole pulsing. Now. Yes, you see the entire cardiac cycle wow. happening. You know, and we have here the eye, here the ear, no, it's, it's... and here the future jaw. Aristotle could see that the heart is one of the very first organs to form in the embryo, and he recognized that the embryo could only develop with a healthy beating heart. It was vital to life. Certainly, Aristotle was the first one to, to realize that there, there is something like um, uh, 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 something forming in, 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 in the York. And I mean, it was, I think, quite an accomplishment to see that the, the heart is all of a sudden there. What did he conclude? I mean, when he saw this, did he? Did well, he, he, he saw that, that the heart is actually forming first, mm. and then from, from the heart, actually, the, all the other, other organs are either der are derivatives of or are actually induced by the heart. Yeah. And this is, is a concept that is, has somehow some truth to it. Right from the start of life, you, the, the heart is, is driving the development. Yeah, the heart is very, very important. It's very essential. I mean, if, a, if an embryo, like a chick embryo, has no heart, it would stop development right away. This is a chick, but would we see something similar if you were looking at, say, I, I don't know, a, a, a dog or a, a, yeah. an ape or a human, yeah. I mean, yeah. do they... they would all look the same way. Right, so this is, a very, this is a very basic blueprint that life has yes. found and... Correct. I mean, if you would see, at this stage, would look at any other embryo, they would look almost the same way. Aristotle had established the heart not just as the seat of our emotions and the teller of truth, but also the force in the body that keeps us alive. But this was also the time of the birth of philosophy, and a view began to emerge that thoughts were different to emotions. That each belonged to different parts of our bodies, our heart and our brain. This idea was promoted in the writing of the Roman physician Galen. For Galen, the head is associated with reason, the Abdomen is associated with the heart and with passion, and the lower regions are associated with procreation. So that is his way of understanding how the body functions, and that's the first time we really have a separation between the emotional heart and the rational brain. Galen's views dominated Western thought for over a thousand years. The heart reigned unchallenged as the seat of our emotional lives an idea expressed in art, literature, and religion. But in the 17th century, our entire understanding of the heart changed. The English physician William Harvey 
made a discovery that would give a new role to the heart. Harvey was interested in how blood moves through the body. According to Galen, blood flowed like the tide, ebbing back and forth. There was no circulation. The arteries and veins were entirely separate. Harvey showed this was wrong. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the small blood vessels in your fingers. Dr. Art Tucker is a clinical scientist at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. He's able to show me what Harvey knew must be true, but was never able to see with his own eyes. That if the blood circulated, then the blood that flowed out must somewhere turn back. The arteries must become veins. And there they are. Oh, what those little loops? Those little loops. These beautiful ghostly figures are the capillaries in my fingernail. It's in the capillaries that arteries turn into veins and blood begins its return trip back to the heart. I can see something going around. And that's the blood. Am I really seeing that or am I you just are, imagining no, it? No, no, no. Even after I've been doing this nearly 20 years, seeing these always excites me. It's fantastic seeing, suddenly seeing them, they seem to fill up. Yeah, so you yeah. see that. Whoa, and, and I this, saw it could zip round there. And this, in one aspect, truly demonstrates what Harvey was trying to say and that the blood flows in a circulatory path, yes. rather than flowing, as Galen said, like the tide in and back. And if you look carefully, is that the blood flows up one side, round the loop, and then returns. And that blood is on return journey back to the heart and the lungs, where the carbon dioxide will be removed and the oxygen will be replenished. Harvey goes down in history as the man who first realized that the same organ that was understood to be the center of our emotions also pumps blood around the body. For Harvey, his discovery did not diminish the heart. It added to its grandeur. But the time in which he lived, the dawn of the mechanical age, interpreted his discovery very differently. In the mind of one man in particular, the French philosopher René Descartes, a radical thought took hold. Descartes was in love with the mechanical and the rational. And it seemed only natural to him to reimagine the human body and mind in terms of the cogs and wheels of the early industrial revolution. I think for Descartes, um, the notion of metaphor is very important because he wants this entirely mechanical account of the world about us. And he wants to use mechanical analogies within that. He wants to say that things are like pumps, they're like engines, they're like clocks, because these are the sorts of things that fit well with his notion of the world. Descartes' ideas recast the human body as an elaborate machine with the rational mind now in command. The stomach and intestines has some sort of refinery where fuel is processed. And the heart, no longer the seat of emotion, nor truth teller, now nothing more than a mechanical pump. And it was Harvey's discovery, seen in the capillaries, that made this view of the heart seem indisputable. Zealous believers of Descartes' ideas could even dismiss the cries of pain from tortured animals as nothing more than the creaking of animal clockwork. They were becoming just like their machines, cold and mechanistic, devoid of feeling. If you want to find one moment where the new view replaced the old, it's when Harvey's work seem to give license to applying this mechanical metaphor, not just to the outside world, but to us as well. Which was ironic because Harvey himself didn't like this new view. And that in itself is quite telling. In Harvey, it's almost as if you can see how the heart was unable to defend itself against the triumph of the rational mind. That triumph might have been lessened had Harvey and the others of his time 
learn more about how the heart pumps blood. In particular, had they known about a discovery made over a century earlier that painted a picture of the heart very different from the crude mechanical pumps of the industrial age. In the Royal Library at Windsor Castle, curator Martin Clayton is showing me beautiful anatomical drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. Drawings that were neglected for almost 400 years after his death. They document da Vinci's remarkable understanding of the heart. Well, these are drawings from the, almost the end of Leonardo's anatomical career. It was done about 15, 12, 15, 13, so Leonardo was uh, 60 years old or thereabouts yes. when he made these dissections. It was what da Vinci discovered about how blood flows through the valves of the heart that was most important. In a remarkable experiment, da Vinci constructed a glass model of the heart's aorta, the artery which takes blood away from the heart to the body. He deduced that as the blood flows through the valve into the aorta, it must make a beautiful swirling pattern called a vortex. And then he describes how he would pump water with the mm -hmm. suspension of grass seeds through his glass model right. so he could observe yes. what were vortices in this chamber now known as the sinus of Valsalva, just above the aortic valve. And he surmised that the purpose of these vortices was to open out the valves. This graceful pattern is called a ring vortex. Da Vinci understood that blood creates this shape as it flows through the valve into the heart's aorta. His key insight was that this swirling of the blood does not work against the heart, but with it, helping close shut the flaps of the valve behind. The workings of the heart had a natural beauty, totally unlike the crude mechanical pumps of the Industrial Revolution. Doesn't it strike you as one of those little moments in history where if we'd gone that way, if someone had said, show me that again, Leonardo, and let me work on that, we would have had such a different view of what we meant by a pump. And I think what people had in mind was the kind of little drum with a stick that goes in yeah. and out, yeah. which... <laughs> And that was so when people said the heart's pump, that's what they had in mind. Yes. And it's Leonardo, nothing there's something, there's something like that. so sympathetic to the structure of the heart. Yes. The awareness that it's not just an accidental form or a crude form. Da Vinci had realized how the movement of the heart and the flow of blood work in natural harmony with one another. First scan starting, David. Okay. David, can you take a breath in, please? Using modern magnetic resonance imaging, it's possible to see in beautiful detail the way in which the blood flows through the heart. David, this breath hold is longer. It's about 20 seconds. Thank you, David. We're finished. Very good images, it's not always the case. You're going to get your okay. Dr. Philip Kilner is a consultant in cardiac imaging at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. Is that me? This is you, really? absolutely. And, uh... Oh, my God. Oh, right. so we're looking from below in this case right. towards the head. So that was my heart as it was actually beating just a couple of minutes ago. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Am I imagine? I mean, I, I'm thinking that I can see all sorts of lovely complications in the flow. Is that real, or am yes. I just? No, that's real. That's that gives fantastic. you a fairly genuine impression of flow. It's averaged over mul multiple mm. heartbeats, so it's not quite real time, and it's to do with the um, tuning of the magnet, that you actually see dark blood joining it. Yes. But nevertheless, that, that blood is showing a But you can, you can actually see how complicated the swirls are in there. Yes. It curls around, swirls here, and then it's... Now, what's interesting is if you listen to somebody's chest, uh, you can hear the heart sounds, yeah. often described as lubbed up, lubbed yeah. up. Well, the timing of that is like this. Lubbed up, lubbed up. Right. 
lubbed up. The deeper sound, the lub, is the closure of the larger inflow valve. Right. And the higher pitch sound is the closure of the smaller aortic valve, which opens and closes roughly every second, faster if you're exercising. For my whole life. For your whole life, day and night, non-stop. Yes. That's about a million times every 10 days. It opens and closes. What a piece of engineering. It's, it's stunning. This beautiful three-dimensional scan of a patient's heart was made by a colleague of Phillips in the United States. The blue shows the blood depleted of oxygen coming back from the body through the heart on its way to the lungs. And the red and yellow shows the oxygenated blood coming back from the lungs through the heart and back out to the body. And if I walk you around this uh, image, if I tip it like this, oh, we're looking as if from the left shoulder. Yes. And now you can begin to see vortices in the left atrium here, oh, yes, swirling around, and in the left ventricle, swirling mainly around the anterior mitral leaflet. So you can see it's coming in, shooting down here, curling round, and then is directed back out that yes, way. Yes, absolutely. So the heart doesn't really have to shove the liquid in a way that the liquid doesn't want to go. The liquid's already heading there because of the shape of the heart. To some extent, I think that's true, absolutely. And especially on exercise, I believe that would be true. When it's halfway between engineering and art. It's, it's There's a beauty to it. To imagine it all both in series and simultaneously, <laughs> flowing yes. day and night, non-stop, yeah. throughout your life. It's, uh, it's, uh, most, that's the most beautiful thing I can imagine. Yeah. It is almost as if the flow of blood has carved out the shape of the heart through evolutionary time. The chambers of the heart are shaped in such a way that the blood swirls around in the direction the heart requires. Even the vast loop made by the blood as it flows around the heart means that as the main pumping chamber recoils, this helps the upper chamber refill with the next batch of blood. And part of this astonishing beauty of the heart had been glimpsed by Leonardo da Vinci. When you look at these two pictures, what you see here is the world of Leonardo of Shakespeare. This is the beginning of modern science, thrilled at exploring the nature of being human. A couple of centuries later, it's completely changed. Here you have our culture thrilled with exploring the world of gears and cogs and pulleys and ratchets and reimagining us as if that's what we were. Mechanizing the world has brought great benefits to humankind. We have built vast cities, industry and advanced technology. But mechanizing the heart has, I believe, done untold damage to how we see ourselves. It has led us to accept that emotions and feelings, these things that were historically connected to the heart, are somehow less important. But recently, I began to question this. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm being honest about it, um, I've spent a lifetime seeing myself as a, as a rational person, essentially summed up by the rational mind, living in a rational world, making rational decisions. And I have emotions, and that's fine, like everybody else. And then something, a, an emotional storm breaks out in your life. And you realize this, there's a whole side to your life, a, a, a powerful emotional life, which I can't, any, I can't think of any longer as just, I have emotions. So I think emotions are, they're like the tide you bob about on them. And if a storm breaks out, God help you. But there's no point in denying that side of you. I think we are not so much rational creatures who happen to have emotions, but emotional creatures who have thoughts. And our hearts remind us of this. I've come to believe that seeing the heart as just a pump does not just distort how we view ourselves, but may also be fundamentally wrong.
Modern science is now beginning to understand the heart in a way that is much more nuanced and complex. It is rethinking the whole relation between heart and mind, emotion and reason. I've come to Oxford to meet Professor David Patterson, who is at the forefront of this new revolution. Yeah, so welcome to Merton College. Thank you very much. You know, my, my research really straddles between these two organs, the, the brain and the heart, Excellent. because historically they've always been viewed as islands to themselves. Fantastic. So, yeah. I want to hear about this. Professor Patterson's research is helping challenge the traditional view of how the heart and brain work together. The brain is made up of billions of neurons and is able to influence the heart rate by sending messages down the different nerve fibers, the wiring of the human body. When the heart receives signals from the brain through the sympathetic nerves, it pumps faster. And when it receives signals through the parasympathetic nerves, it slows down. On its own, this appears to fit with the picture of the heart enslaved to the brain. But the true relationship between the two organs is far more nuanced. If you look at a heart, yeah. I, have one and I happen to have a heart <laughs> in my pocket, which all good physiologists <laughs> carry around with them. But the traditional anatomical view of the nervous system in the heart is that you, ha you, know, you have these major two nerves coming down from the brain. Which is just telling the heart what to do. Speed up, slow down. Yeah. But in the heart itself, you know, you have around 10,000 or so of very specialized neur neurons that sit there. And these predominantly lie around the right atrial surface. Not just surface. nerve cells. Not just nerve You're cells. using neuron advisedly. That, that form networks. Okay. And, th and that begs the question. Yeah, <laughs> begging many questions. Well, <laughs> what, what is their role? What, what, why are they there? Why has nature put them there? Yes. Why, can, why, why are you the first person to tell me this? Well, it's not established in textbooks. And there's but a very, why not? And, and there's a very, well, I think the textbooks need to be rewritten, and they are being rewritten. Right. It's astonishing to think that neurons, the very cells that make up the brain in our heads, and give us the ability to think, are also present within the heart. And there are so many of them that these neurons have been called by those who study them the heart's little brain. Much about the heart's neurons is still unknown, but one thing is clear, that the brain in our heads doesn't simply control the heart, but works in partnership with it. It's a little bit different from college. What you're looking at is a section of tissue taken from a rat's heart. It contains most of the neurons that make up the heart's little brain. The tissue is being kept alive by a solution of nutrients and the bubbling oxygen. And if you look closely, you can see that the tissue is beating of its own accord. So this is a, you know, just a little bit of that right atrial tissue and inside there are these neurons. Right. And in fact, what we see here is that the tissue is beating by itself. You know. So is that a, it's a, it looks like a heartbeat, is it? That's right, I it's mean, very similar, it but is. it's an actual contraction. So this right. is beating at about 180, almost 200 beats per minute. Professor Patterson is going to show me that by sending an electric signal to the heart's little brain, that little brain can then slow down the heart rate. This mimics how the brain in our heads asks the heart to slow down, a process that relies on the neurons in the heart. We've got a very small electrode sitting over by these neurons, so we're going to excite them. I get to press the button? And then look at the trace. I'm yeah. nervous about it. Though. Yeah. Pick yeah, it up, see? Pick it up. Oh, uh, my God. See that? See it slow down? That's down? dramatic. So what you're doing is you're, okay. you're activating the neurons. So I sent it a little you sent it like an impulse signal. Yeah, mental signal. Oh, and it's going further down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you're, you're maintaining the I stimulation. I better switch it off. So turn it off, and then the parasympathetic nervous system yeah, it's is, now, back. is, is yeah, now back yeah, yeah, on. Back is coming. 
and up it comes again. It is, it, isn't, isn't it? It's fast too, isn't it? It's very quick. Look at that. that in fact, it, off it happens boop. within about a beat. What we've done is completely taken the brain out of the picture. Right. We've just electrically excited those neurons. Yes. So right down at the target the neurons tissue, in, in the, the heart. heart. And now they're taking over. They're, they're taking they're doing over it. and they're releasing the chemical messengers to then slow the heart down. So in a way, you, that, that's demonstrating how much of that neural control is, is in the heart. Is in the heart itself. Because we, it's we, we evidently don't have a brain, we have a small... Stimulator. Small, grotty looking pile of simple yeah. electronics, that's not a brain. That's right, yeah. So it, the, the, the decision, using the word slightly metaphorically, is happening in there. It's happening right in there, that's right. Completely devoid of the central wow. nervous system. That's rather impressive. And it yeah. looks great. Yeah. This shows the extent to which it is these neurons in the heart that control what the heart does, not the brain. Professor Patterson's work is revealing just how complex the little brain in the heart really is. Let's see if we can see some of the heart cells beating. Well, so there, there, there. there. Okay. These are the neurons that make up the heart's little brain. They live side by side with the cardiac muscle cells in the heart. They really are a unit then, aren't they? I mean, it's not just, here's the heart doing everything the heart does, and then we've just got some neurons just, just watching what's going on. There's, there's an active partnership here. Oh, yeah, no question about that. We need to understand this. It's very poorly understood the detailed neurochemistry, the detailed electrophysiology. We're only really starting to scratch the surface of this network in the heart. Gosh, we are a long way from just playing with the plumbing of, of a pump. Much more complex than that. I suppose I, I, feel, I feel optimistic having talked to Professor Patterson. Because I, I do have to admit that after the first day, I felt, I felt quite concerned. I mean, we got such a telling off that I thought, well, maybe, maybe this film really has gone off in all the wrong direction. Maybe what we're trying to say is just silly. But having talked to Professor Patterson, I, I, feel, I feel that there really is something important. Sci something scientifically true, but also something important that we are trying to say. I feel good about that. Modern science is now painting a picture of the heart that I believe is much closer to how we really are. The heart is a pump that does respond when the brain asks it to, but it is not enslaved to the brain. Its relationship with the brain is more like a marriage, living in partnership, with each dependent upon the other. But most importantly, it seems to me science is now restoring to the heart something of what rightfully belongs to it, our emotions. Because it is not just thoughts that govern our lives. Well, a couple of years ago, my wife became profoundly depressed, clinically depressed. And the, the person I fell in love with, the person who I've lived with my adult life, is um, it's gone. And it, and it, it it's, it's a very painful thing, not just rationally painful, it, I never knew what that phrase, you know, my heart ached or my heart broke. That was just poetry for me, but it isn't anymore. I 
I just suddenly was confronted by a question I never thought about, about this relationship between the, the, the life of, of, of my heart, the emotional life and the emotional center of it, which when it was fine, I never thought about it, I just took it for granted. But something went wrong with my wife's mind. Uh, it's hurting my heart. Can you make sense of the most emotionally difficult things in your life simply by having a rational think about them? This is what I've tried for the last two years, and I can tell you it doesn't work. I'm not going to find the way forward through an emotional storm just by consulting the rational part of my mind. I feel there's a whole other side to me, which unless I give it a voice, unless I listen to what it's telling me, I'm not going to make it through. And that's my heart. But what does it mean to follow your heart? I would like to think that the heart's influence is as it has always been imagined by the poets, that it makes us kinder, more compassionate people. The final thing I want to explore about the heart is how it can affect the mind. In this experiment, images of frightened and calm faces are being shown to me for split seconds. Some in time with my heartbeat, and others out of time. And I'm being asked to judge the intensity of the face. This research is being carried out by Professor Hugo Critchley and Dr. Sarah Garfinkel at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Um, how was that? Stressful. No, it was quite it was quite weirdly intense. And the second one started out fine. Yeah. And then got more worrisome. Okay, so we can come through here now. What Hugo and Sarah are interested in is whether my brain experiences the faces differently if they are shown to me in time with my heart. This is your intensity ratings here. Right. And if things if fear faces were out of sync with your heart, mm -hmm. then you were you rated them as less intense. If they were in right. sync with your heart, then you rated them as more intense. And if you look at the other categories, there was no difference of heartbeat. So um, neutral faces, it made it's no difference exactly. So the only time the heart was influencing your emotion ratings was when it was an explicit fear face. Right. The results show that when frightened faces were shown in time with my heartbeat, I perceive them to be more frightened. In other words, how my mind processed the fear faces was affected by my heart. From the brain scans, Hugo and Sarah are able to pinpoint the exact region of the brain that is affected by the heart. When your brain is processing fear in time with your heart beating, you get this great mass of activity in a region of the brain called the amygdala, which is known to be oh, the yes. threat processing region of the brain. Just showing that the amygdala processes fear in conjunction with the heart's oh. signaling when it's beating. Does that light up more when it's in sync with the heart? Absolutely, it's yes. Not? Really? Yes. yes. But the experiment had an unexpected effect on me. Although I was being shown frightened faces, it was not fear that I felt, but concern. The faces were reminding me of someone I care about. It was quite an intense experience because I was looking at those faces and f feeling worried about those people. I mean, not those people. I was looking at those faces. It was reminding me of s s someone I care about and thinking, thinking about their 
their pain or their sadness. And, and that was what made it very intense for me. But is that really what was going on? Uh, so, uh, certainly, the way we un interpret other people's emotions is, is very much um, influenced by our capacity to embody their emotional states. If I see someone in pain, so something bad happens to them, and I, you're saying that my, my heart helps me to create some understanding of them Fe from, a, from an feeling. emotional level, yeah, absolutely. So certainly this, this emotional system is very much tuned into, into um, emotions like compassion for other people, empathizing with people's emotional states, as well as producing the, the kind of shared joy and, and positive emotions that, that, you know, that bond us socially. That's, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So that, 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 you know, that phrase, you know, I, I, I feel for you. You do. What you're telling me is my heart is able to make that true, that statement. The heart is certainly a big component. I mean, I consider the heart to be one of the main channels of that kind of information. It seems that the heart beats not just with our own emotions, but also with other people's. It is our hearts, working in tandem with our brains, that allow us to feel for others and painful though it might be, at times, to experience that compassion, it is ultimately what makes us human. For me, compassion is the heart's gift to the rational mind. That the things I hoped would be true about being human, I'm reassured that they are true. And that the, the things which I hoped would be how we work and the kind of creatures we are, they really are. You can experimentally see that is how we work. And it does underpin the thing about us which I personally feel is what makes us a worthwhile species, that we can feel compassion for other people. I'm not really hugely impressed that we can build faster jets, but that we're made in such a way that we can feel someone else's pain and feel compassion for them I think that's fantastic. In the end, this battle between the head and the heart to decide what's the best part of us leaves no triumphant victor. In reality, we need both. The heart may be more than just a pump. It may help us to care for one another, but it is stuck in the present. It is only the brain that can imagine a different world and invent it. But if we want that world to be a better world, then surely we also have to listen to the heart.